great. Well, good evening, everyone, and, and Happy New Year. I'm Mary Lee Kiernan. I'm the president and CEO of the YWCA Greenwich, and I want to welcome all of you to this very special conversation this evening. Uh, you know, it's hard to remember a time when the mission of this organization, eliminating racism and empowering women, has been more relevant and more urgent. Uh, and to further that mission, each year, the YWCA Greenwich and its partners pay tribute to the late Dr. Martin Luther King by focusing on a topic that he would have cared about deeply. With conservative estimates of at least 14 or 40.3 million people worldwide who are involved in human trafficking, we thought, of course, this is a natural and very critically important topic for us to focus on this year. And of course, with the headline last weekend in the Greenwich Time about two local teenagers being sex trafficked by Backpage.com, we thought that now is the time for this organization and for our partners to join the coalition of advocates who are fighting against modern slavery. Uh, you know, as the most prominent civil rights activist in this country's history, Dr. King fought to free people from the crippling discrimination and poverty that still makes the most vulnerable in our society easy prey for abuse and for trafficking. So we are very proud this evening to carry on Dr. King's legacy and join with you tonight to work on modern day slavery. What will tonight mean for you exactly? Well, we want you to come away with two important outcomes. Number one, a really robust understanding of this complicated topic. And number two, a sense of what you can do as an individual to help join this fight. So you will see on your seats a program uh, which has further details. There's information about the signs of someone who is a victim of human trafficking or is vulnerable to human trafficking. And there's also information about resources to help in this fight. And at the end of the panel discussion, you will have time to ask questions. And we look forward to answering them. There are going to be um, white uh, cards distributed and pens available so that you'll be able to write down your questions and we'll get them up to our moderator. Um, before I introduce the panel, I want to thank uh, a number of people and mention a couple of uh, very, very important people. And first we have a video greeting from Senator, Senator Richard Blumenthal who has been very active in, in this fight. That'll come up on Hi everyone, I'm Richard Blumenthal, your United States Senator, and thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. My apologies for being absent. I'm with you in spirit. I want to applaud and really thank the YWCA Greenwich and all the other community partner organizations for co-sponsoring and hosting this conversation about the fight against human trafficking. My experience as a former state law enforcement officer, as well as a federal prosecutor, has shown me how important and often excruciatingly difficult the war against sex trafficking really is. As Connecticut Attorney General, I saw how challenging it was for law enforcement to develop cases against sex traffickers and employ anti-trafficking laws given resource constraints. My experience at the state level led me, along with Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, to launch and co-chair the Senate caucus to end human trafficking. Clear to me now, the websites facilitating illegal sex trafficking must face repercussions in order for law enforcement to succeed in combating these absolutely horrific crimes. In the Senate, I have introduced the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, also known as SESTA. This measure would clarify that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act was never intended to protect websites that facilitate sex trafficking. Right now, they have immunity. And this measure will ensure that victims and survivors get their day in court, overcoming that legal immunity. 
Festa is as bipartisan as any measure could be. Senator Portman, uh, Republican, and I have worked together on this bill from the very beginning. It has now attracted more than 60 co-sponsors in the Senate on both sides of the aisle. It also has the support of major human trafficking organizations, law enforcement, and tech companies. As all of you know, there is so much work to be done to combat sex trafficking. This measure, SESTA, is one important piece of that puzzle. And I will not stop fighting until it is the law of the land. Let me just close by recognizing the invaluable work of groups like the YWCA of Greenwich, an organization that I have long admired for shining a light on human trafficking. It has led important conversations on what Americans can and what we all must do to fight this scourge. Thank you so much for all that you do. I look forward to seeing my many friends in person very, very soon. And again, my apologies for being here in Washington rather than with you there. Thank you so much. So we're very fortunate tonight also to have our congressman with us. And, and Jim Himes is going to come up and just say a few quick words. Jim. Good evening, everybody. A uh, few quick words are thank you very much. Uh, I think it is spectacular that we are using Martin Luther King Day, celebrating an amazing American, not with a backward-looking memorial, but with a forward-looking call to action on one of the most pernicious uh, and morally horrible challenges that we face. In government, the particularly pernicious problems call for a whole-of-government approach. This problem calls for a whole of society approach. Uh, it's not just public officials, elected officials, it's law enforcement, it's, it's faith communities, it's all of us knowing uh, what exactly human trafficking looks like and committing ourselves to doing everything that we can to stop it. I'll start with a mea culpa. If you'd asked me 10 years ago about human trafficking, I would have said that's somebody else's problem, not here in Connecticut, not here in the US. The fact is, as Mary Lee alluded to, it's not just here in the US, here in Connecticut, it's here in Greenwich. And so we all have a responsibility in as much as we feel an obligation to live in a small way up to the legacy uh, of Martin Luther King, um, to be conscious of this and to do everything that we can to combat this problem. My own ignorance, by the way, was changed by some of the people uh, who are on this panel uh, tonight. And so it's gonna be a real treat to be educated by and to work together to figure out how we, as good people in the spirit of Martin Luther King, can change this. Mary Lee, thank you. Uh, thank you to the YWCA for taking up this important fight. Acknowledgements. I know uh, State Representative Fred Camillo is, is either here or about to be here with us this evening. Fred is a, a really great partner to the YWCA. I also want to acknowledge Chief Jim Keevy, uh, Chief of our Greenwich Police Department. Sergeant Brent Reeves, I think, is here as well. They are also uh, critically uh, important partners to the YWCA as we battle domestic abuse in this community and its uh, trafficking as well. And our first selectman, Peter Tessie, I know intends to arrive at some point. There's a really important uh, capital uh, improvements hearing over at Town Hall tonight, but he should be with us later. So let me do a few other thank yous. And, and first to our almost 30 community partners who have joined with us this evening to partner on this event. Their logos, I think, are up on the screen. And we can't thank you all enough for helping to raise awareness about this topic, about this event. Uh, you used your leadership, your social media, your address lists, and we really are grateful for your collaboration on this. Um, and I do want to point out Elizabeth Bogle, who is partnering with us from the uh, Global Partnership to End Human Trafficking, also known as Global Pet. This is a new local organization. They have a table of goods set up outside uh, where they want to help raise funds to support their work. Uh, to help uh, support the victims of human trafficking here in this state. So I hope you will get to know this organization as much as you can. Um, so now let me introduce our panel. Um, you'll notice that many of uh, the panelists and people here tonight are wearing blue. The Department of Homeland Security is 
uh, announced that they're launching the Blue campaign to raise awareness about human trafficking, so that's why we look a little monochrome up here tonight. Um, first, we have with us Jillian Gilchrist. She's the Director of Health Professional Out Outreach at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and she is chair of the Connecticut Trafficking in Persons Council, which is a statewide council comprised of state agencies, nonprofits, and service providers to study human trafficking in the state. And the council also makes recommendations to the General Assembly on policy to fight trafficking, to get after uh, traffickers and those who buy, and to assist and protect victims. And I can assure you, Jillian played a central role in the anti-trafficking legislation that was passed uh, in 2016 and previous to that in Connecticut. Next, we are so pleased to have Joette Katz, who is the commissioner of the State Department of Children's and Children and Families and a former justice on the Connecticut State Supreme Court. In her nearly 20 years on the court, she heard over 2,000 cases, authored over 430 majority opinions, as well as nearly 100 dissenting and concurring opinions. She also served as the administrative judge of the appellate system for the state of Connecticut. And today at DCF, Joette is responsible for over 4,000 children for whom the department has custody and guardianship and oversees services to 36,000 children and 16,000 families in need in the state. Rod Katabi is the Director of Safety and Justice Initiatives Advisor for Grace Farms Foundation. Rod uh, led the New Haven, Connecticut Office of the Department of Homeland Security. He started his career as a federal agent for the FBI and has over 20 years of experience coordinating high profile protection details and major criminal investigations around the world related to child exploitation, human trafficking, terrorism, immigration, and much more. Vincent Napo is a partner at PCBA Law Offices in Seattle, Washington. Thank you, Vinny, for coming all the way out from the West Coast. And he is part of the legal team that brought the only successful lawsuit against Backpage.com in the country, and you'll hear a lot more about that. Vinny fights hard for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to obtain justice against abusers and the entities who facil facilitate such crimes. Vinny devotes the bulk of his practice toward empowering and providing a voice to these men, women, and children, and has successfully litigated claims against individual perpetrators and large institutions. And finally, our moderator, Krishna Patel. She is the General Counsel and Director of Justice Initiatives at Grace Farms Foundations, and she's a former Assistant U.S. Attorney for the State of Connecticut. At Grace Farms, Krishna is an active strategist on initiatives to combat human trafficking on a global, national, and state level. As Deputy Chief of National Security and Major Crimes in the District of Connecticut, Krishna worked with federal agencies to investigate and prosecute a broad range of federal criminal cases, including national security, cybercrime, human trafficking, child exploitation, and much more. And since joining Grace Farms, she really has been at the center, and I mean the center, of organizing actions against human trafficking in this state, including helping to draft the amendments to strengthen Connecticut's existing anti-trafficking laws that I referenced earlier, and also to deploy big data, innovative data platforms to help law enforcement in the fight against human trafficking. And I want to mention that Krishna is also the leader in a very exciting new initiative called Unchained, and that's a media campaign to raise awareness about human trafficking and to help disrupt and eradicate this crime. And we're just going to pause for a quick few seconds to show you one of the new ads in the Unchained media campaign.
please help me welcome our outstanding panelists that have joined us. This evening. Krishna, let's get started. Thank you. Um, so I promise you, while I may have been an instigator or one of them for Unchained, um, it's so much bigger than I am. Um, I think the reason uh, I love the Unchained video so much, it was actually, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, Grace Farms Foundation as a whole, the entire foundation, I promise you, got involved with um, WPP and a group of other partners to see what a media campaign would look like to try to bring awareness to the issue of um, human trafficking, uh, a, a euphemism for modern day slavery at a international and global level. So this is very much of a raw cut of a video of a much larger uh, campaign that is um, actually in part uh, being led by Sharon Prince <laughs> here uh, uh, of Grace Farms Foundation. So if you uh, are someone who might be interested, please let Sharon know. Um, what I do think is powerful about this video is um, the idea of how expansive trafficking is. And so when we talk about trafficking, it is a form of contemporary slavery. Um, I, a huge thanks to Mary Lee and the YWCA um, and my other friends, including Elizabeth, uh, for really taking this issue on, particularly given um, Martin Luther King's legacy. Uh, I do think it is our, the civil rights issue of our day, and I also think it's one of the greatest humanitarian crises, if not the greatest, that we're currently facing. When we talk about modern day slavery, we're ta you know, when you, you distill it to its essential components, you're talking about compelled work. You're talking about people who are in situations where they are um, having to engage in doing something of commercial value, um, and it's compelled. It's under some type of force, fraud, or coercion. It's not voluntary. Uh, they are not free to leave. And we generally break it down into sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Uh, the UN took on a pretty um, amazing uh, initiative, along with Walk Free, the international labor organization decided to try to see to, if they could collect data over the course of one year to see how many people were enslaved. Doing a 50 country survey, uh, they determined in 2016, 40.3 people at any given time were in some type of slavery. Uh, when you break that down even further, 71% of those individuals were women or children. Um, those are staggering numbers, especially when you think that's a, that's a 50, uh, country survey that was not extrapolated from. Um, so those are why we're using those current statistics. In our own country, uh, we also know that we have an issue with both labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Uh, Backpage is definitely, uh, I think, uh, gives you a, a very clear story of what minor sex trafficking in our country can look like. Uh, the numbers are, are not precise. Uh, the Department of Justice estimates that between one and a half and two and a half million youth uh, become runaways under the age of 18 every year, and of those, roughly 15% become trafficking victims. Uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children puts it at one in every six. Uh, if you are looking at those kinds of numbers, you're looking at an epidemic in our country. And so, um, Congress, Congressman Himes is quite correct. It's not just something that happens in Thailand and Cambodia and you know Eastern Europe. It's something that's happening every single day in our country. And when you think about what's happening, it's the fact that our own children, when we're talking about child sex trafficking, are actually being forcibly raped day in and day out. Uh, I know that uh, I had kind of given an indication to our panel uh, a little earlier in terms of what the number, uh, in terms of kind of what the discussion would be. But if I could just interrupt that and ask Commissioner Katz, Joette, just to give the statistics for Connecticut. So in 2016 alone, we had 202 unique clients identified and served. Of those, 184 were female. And the interesting thing is, you might think that they were all runaways, they were all in living in, a, in shelters or group homes, that is not true. Of the 202, 118 were living with parents or guardians. And since, you, we've, since you've been collecting data, the, of the children that you have currently in DCF care or in, interacting with the foster care system, currently how many to date um, are identified as trafficking victims? And can you give us a ratio between girls and boys? Well, we only start, 
We only started tracking this in uh, 2008. So between 2008 and 2017, we had 850 unique referrals. But we, be, by increasing the number of mandated reporters, increasing our care line capacity, uh, you need to know we get 120 thousand calls a year into care line and that's just of calls not 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 exclusively sex trafficking obviously but all calls involving children so we've we've increased the number of mandated reporters increased the penalties for failure to report and as a consequence the numbers are going up so the 850 uh, if we had everything today that we had or back then that we have today I, I'm quite convinced the numbers would be significantly more uh, the voice just so you know Forgive me. So, of, for example, of the 202, 184 were female, 17 were male, one was transgendered. Uh, the race, if, if you want to know the race breakup, is that yeah. a consequence? Uh, African American, 57, Caucasian, 74, Hispanic, 48, multiracial, 16, uh, and I can go on and on. At the age of victimization, one was under 10, 12, 11 to 12 years of age, 44 of them were 13 and 14, 75 were 15 and 16, 60 were 17 to 18. Over 18 is one and unknown nine. The youngest sex trafficking child uh, that I recall in 2015 was nine years of age. And uh, I know that the state of Connecticut breaks down by geographic region, can you just uh, in terms of the geographic region, where in Connecticut are we seeing the highest rate of trafficking? We have, we have six regions of DCF, and region number one, which is Bridgeport, Norwalk, Stamford, had the highest number of girls being sex trafficked. 49 out of the 202 came from region one, this, this region, where we're living today, currently. Thank you. Um, so I know we're going to focus a lot of the discussion today on minor sex trafficking, which is, I think, more of the epidemic that we're seeing. I think labor trafficking is something that remains somewhat hidden. I do, for those of you who are interested, polarisproject.org uh, puts out the numbers nationally for labor trafficking. They received 5,400 uh, labor trafficking cases on their hotline uh, last year and over 2,200 calls for sex trafficking. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to turn to Rod. Uh, Rod, you've actually been investigating and prosecuting all sorts of cases for over 20 years. Um, I know that trafficking, you've done international trafficking cases. You've done them out of Haiti and Nicaragua and South Africa. You've trained law enforcement overseas. You've done them here in Connecticut. You've done them in New York. Um, can you give a, a sense to the audience of why these cases are much harder than other cases, um, as well as why the victim never views law enforcement as wearing the white hat, why the victim never ever wants to cooperate with law enforcement in these cases. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. Um, when we deal with human beings, especially, uh, I work a lot of uh, cases involving minors um, who uh, associate themselves with a pimp who treats them well. And uh, somehow they feel obligated to please him. And that's what they do. So when a law enforcement officer comes in and, and talks to the, to the victim, uh, basically in her mind, this law enforcement officer is taking away her livelihood, whatever she knows, what she knows, what she lived. Um, what's happened in law enforcement, and I, and I was one of the one guilty of it in the old days when I used to go and work solicit cases, my only, my only objective is really to catch the pimp or the bad guy. I really didn't care about the victim. I just wanted a statement from her. I wanted her to basically work with me, and after that, once I got my case done, it's over. So law enforcement came a long way. So now we're trying to work with service providers. We're trying to really understand the problem and trying to establish uh, 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 some kind of uh, trust between the victim and law enforcement. And in terms, of, in terms of understanding the difference between prostitution and trafficking, 
you know, just that training alone for law enforcement. Can you just explain that? Because I think the lexicon is so important. Yes. Um, you all know prostitution has been around forever. However, the traffic victims is, in the old days we used to, we couldn't make a distinction between a prostitute and somebody who's trafficked, somebody who's being, who's prostituting against her will, who is forced, of course, to do this. And also, um, when we have minors, and how we deal with the minors, um, You all know that minors cannot consent, okay? And they automatic traffic, even they're willing to. Um, I've had a case in, 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 the, in the Bronx and that I worked with Krishna, when I had a 14-year-old girl who will not, will not walk with me, even though I'm trying to uh, use all kind of, <laughs> so we don't want to go into details on this. But it's very hard for the victim. They see law enforcement. They see law enforcement again as, as a very, uh, uh, um, I don't know, very uh, yeah. Well, I won't say the bad guy. <laughs> you know, but a per, as a, a, a person, uh, an officer who did not understand them, who did not, you know, I've interviewed. And, and Christian can tell you, I've interviewed uh, victims where it takes maybe days, days to really establish trust. And um, so we're trying to understand, and I, that's what I'm saying, between the difference in prostitution and traffic, understand that this person, even though she's prostituting herself and she's being trafficked uh, she, against her will, you have to understand that she is a victim, that she's not. Uh, 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 guilty of that, you know, that crime. And I think, you know, one of the things I've learned as a prosecutor is the family myth dynamic that the pimp can create, right? I am your boyfriend, I am your father, I am the person who loves you, I'm the one who can take care of you, I'm the one who fills your emotional need. It is such a powerful dynamic. And what it takes to interrupt that is so extraordinary um, that they're, they're not going to turn to you. You're not gonna be the one who's gonna take care of them. You're not gonna be the one who's gonna love them. And so these are exceptionally difficult cases to investigate. Um, it is so much easier, right, to do the drug case. It's so much easier to do the organized crime case. Um, it is really hard um, to actually do these cases. Um, I do actually want to turn then to kind of giving you an idea of what a typical case now um, looks like. And, um, you know, Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, 10 years ago, trafficking was something that was still happening offline more than online. Uh, we saw commercial child exploitation, right? Child pornography, you know, those kinds of things happening online. Everything has now moved online. Yeah, when I used to be with the U.S. Customs in the old days uh, at JFK Airport, we used to have books, you know, books that come in with child porn material, and we used to do control delivery. Now, there are no books. It's all on, online, all on the internet. I want to turn to Vinny, um, and I think before we turn to um, talking about Backpage, I know we have a clip or a trailer that might actually help you <laughs> with a little bit of a background on the case, and so if we can actually play that, that'd be great. This is the United States. There's no possible way this is true. Wholesaling children in Washington State. 
or not. I'd like to meet the member of the judiciary or a member of Congress that thinks that the status quo is satisfactory. I'd like to call the CEO of Backpage, uh, Carl Ferrer. I've never seen anything like that. What are they hiding? This hearing is adjourned. There is a question as to what kind of society we're going to be, whether we're going to tolerate sexual trafficking in children that is an affront to everything that we believe. I want my daughter to hold her head high and know that none of this was her fault. I am Jane Doe. I am Jane Doe. It's time for us all to stand up and be strong. in the way of little self-promotion. If you haven't seen the movie, you can see it at Grace Farms tomorrow night <laughs> at 6 o'clock. Um, but, you know, the question of this is really about what kind of society we want to be. Um, the issue of the CDA, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, and Backpage to me really is about that. It's about our fundamental values, right? Because to me, at its core, it's bringing up the issue of individual safety and privacy. Um, you know, the safety of our children and, and the idea of free speech, right? And, and giving vibrancy to the internet. Um, but we have to be able to protect our children at its core, and we don't seem to be able to be doing a good job. Um, for those of you who may not have seen the movie, there have been um, many cases that have been filed against Backpage uh, by tremendous lawyers <coughs> um, in cities uh, like Boston and Chicago. The only successful case to date um, has been the one that Vinny and Eric Bauer and a group of people were involved in in the state of Washington. And so, Vinny, if I could start by asking you just to tell us a little bit about your background, um, tell us a little bit about what got you involved in the Backpage case, and to help uh, us understand why you folks, you think you folks were successful where no one else has been. Sure. Uh, is this on now? Uh, actually, no, I'm curious just to get a sense of who I'm talking to. How, how many people have seen I Am Jane Doe? Okay, so everybody else who hasn't seen it, come tomorrow night. <laughs> and I'm not, and that is not a just, that's not just a shameless plug. Um, it really is a tremendous film, and it will, it will, it will blow you away uh, at what's happening right beneath your nose, even in, even in towns like Greenwich, which I've never been here, but it's lovely, and uh, I can imagine it's as much of a shock to you all as it was to me when I first started doing this type of work. So um, anyhow, so how I got into this work, um, I, so I, I work in the area of child sexual abuse in all different contexts. Um, children who are abused in the household, children who are abused by uh, you know, members of the clergy, scouts, youth organizations. So we uh, were presented with the opportunity to work on these cases in 2011. Uh, three different families came to um, Eric Bauer, my co-counsel's office, and they asked us if we would represent them in a lawsuit against his website <coughs> on behalf of two 12-year-old girls. They were both in the seventh grade when they were trafficked, and a 15-year-old girl. Um, they're all in some way uh, part of the I Am Jane Doe film. JS was the lead plaintiff, and she's featured most heavily in that film, if you've seen it. Um, we uh, looked at the case, and um, immediately looked at this CDA issue. I had never heard of the CDA. I remember Google going black back maybe five, six years ago. Does everybody, anybody remember that? Where they like they turned the lights out for a day. That was in protest to potentially amending this CDA law. So this has been something that's come up uh, frequently. Do you want me to talk about the CDA? So um, we could talk for an entire day about the CDA, but in 30 seconds or less. The CDA is a federal statute that was passed in the <coughs> mid 90s. And the reason it was passed was to provide websites with uh, immunity from being sued for publishing third party content that may have resulted in some sort of uh, harm to somebody else. The classic case that it was intended to protect against 
is defamation. And the concern obviously was websites may have thousands or millions of users. If websites can get sued for publishing defamatory content, the internet may not be able to flourish the way that we're hoping that it can flourish. So it's a very well-intentioned statute, um, and it's been an important part of the internet becoming what it is today. The problem is you've got companies like Backpage who've been able to use this law to argue you can't sue us civilly. It doesn't apply to federal criminal laws, but you can't sue us civilly. Uh, this is third-party content. The trafficker put this ad on this website. We have a we have a, 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 a specific posting rule that says you can't do that, which we know is total BS, but they have it, right? Can't sue us. And believe it or not, that's been an effective argument. Uh, even though if you look at this website, you saw, especially in 2011, in 2011, it was just, there wasn't anything hidden at all. It was blatant commercial sex trafficking. I mean, as I won't even use the words because it's, it's just hard to say out loud, but just think of the most disgusting terminology you can imagine. And you, you probably said, that's what you saw on Backpage back then. So I mean, there was absolutely no ambiguity here. This was commercial sex. This website was profiting from commercial sex. Our clients got trafficked on this website while you made what we thought at the time was $20, $30 million maybe a year. Our numbers were very low. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So in any event, seemed like they should have some safeguards, protections. If this is supposedly a legitimate website, why aren't you doing more to protect kids or to prevent this from happening? And so, that's, so we filed suit despite uh, most expectations were that we would get dismissed, like all the other cases. Um, do you want me to stop there for another question? I can keep, I apologize. I, this has been five years of my life and we're just getting started, so. There's a motion to dismiss filed against you, like everyone else, right? Yeah. Um, so can you just tell us, uh, so for those of you, um, just very quickly, when the CDA gets enacted in the 1990s, um, I just want to be very clear, uh, you know, this is a statutory privilege. It gives far more of a grant of um, protection than the First Amendment, right, would, because the First Amendment doesn't protect you from defamation. So it's the ability to let the vibrancy and the internet thrive. Um, the down, you know, so to me, there is no absolute immunity. It's this idea of the normal standard is known or should have known, that that's not the standard that's gonna apply, um, and there's not gonna be the normal regulation. So the question is, what would the standard be that should apply? Um, what the Senate investigative report um, has now concluded, which, which the movie talks about, um, which is the one that Portman and McCaskill wrote, as well as the Washington Post, um, we now know that the back page um, CEO and, and the leadership were aware that there were minors being trafficked. Uh, unquestionably, right? yeah, oh yeah. And we now know um, that the Washington Post disclosed after talking to employees, whistleblowers of Backpage, uh, that they worked to quote, put lipstick on a pig, that they actually worked to, uh, in collusion with the traffickers, is that correct? Yeah, oh yeah, no, we, we took depositions of some of these guys uh, who worked within the company and they testified without uh, hesitation that their job at this company was to quote unquote sanitize prostitution ads. Now, of course, there is a difference between prostitution and trafficking. We touched on that a moment ago, but I don't care if you're sanitizing prostitution or trafficking, it's illegal. What you're doing is illegal and you shouldn't be allowed to profit from that. And were they aware uh, or did they actually change the language if they knew that they were kids, they were minors? Oh, yes they did, yeah, absolutely. So that was, do you want me to talk about that yes, for a minute? Yes, please. Sure, so, so we got into a major, um, the, so this is a legal term of art that we use in complex civil cases, a major shit throw with back page. <laughs> and what that means is you're going to court a lot and you're fighting and you, and you even go up to the Supreme Court like we did to get authority from the, from the justices that enable you to get um, deep into the corporate records and compel them to have to come answer questions. So ultimately we gathered around, oh, probably 50 to 75,000 pages of corporate records, looking at emails and things of that nature. Much of it's in the public record now uh, from, our, from at least this particular JS case in Washington. And so you can see for yourself if you wanted to pull the pleadings or you can email me and I'm happy to send uh, the briefing that we've put into the record. But yeah, you'll see that this company um, 
had identified hundreds, thousands of terms that they felt were indicators of trafficking, indicators of child sex trafficking, indicators of prostitution, and what they would do is they would automatically and manually remove these indicators, and then they would publish the sanitized ad. And from our estimation, what it looked like they were trying to do uh, was try to kind of get themselves some cover, try to assuage law enforcement concerns, try to uh, make things look a little cleaner, and that's kind of the word that they started using after 2011, was let's clean this website up. Well, not only that, they were communicating with traffickers and with individuals using the website. Again, email me, I'll send you the records I've put in the public record and you can read for yourselves. You got the CEO of the company talking to these individuals saying, hey, you can't post this ad with sex for money language. Please try again. I mean, <laughs> right? And so of course, so, anyway, so we started develop, we start getting this evidence and you can imagine um, the momentum built quickly. And the judges, I think, uh, at least in our, where we had this case venued, uh, are not stupid, and they were able to you know, see exactly what's going on here. And you don't need to be able to show uh, more than the opportunity that, that whatever you're trying to get will reasonably lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So clearly, everything we were finding was starting to support our theory, which, by the way, we brought RICO claims. I probably didn't mention that. But we have a terrific state RICO statute uh, that has a civil cause of action. So we weren't necessarily suing them for trafficking, which would be a lot more difficult to prove. So you've got to show coercion and duress and things of that nature. Back page is probably too far removed. But we had uh, facilitating commercial sex in spades. And, uh, and so that, that was probably going to be our lead theory at trial. And so for all of those you may not know, RICO is the racketeering con uh, conspiracy. Um, so if you look at the Senate report, it estimates that 70%, based on, on the NICMEC, National Center for Missing Exploited Children, 70% of the kids in the United States, when the report came out last year, were actually being uh, uh, advertised on Backpage. So 70% of all kids who were actually being trafficked, minor sex trafficking, were actually reported on Backpage.com. So Rod, um, in terms of as a law enforcement agency, is that consistent with what you were seeing? Um, was it higher or lower? About that? Yeah, about that. Yeah, and, and so can you just quickly talk about what big data platforms are doing in terms of helping to go after these uh, cases like Backpage? Yeah, absolutely. I wish I had uh, big data when I was started on the job. Uh, <laughs> Big data is, what we have, we have a couple of organizations, I'm not sure if I can mention the names, but what they do is they scrape uh, information uh, on public information. And what they do is, there's a company who scrapes probably like one million ads a day and store this. And uh, I know in Connecticut, these companies scrape probably close to a couple thousand ads in Connecticut a day. So this company gives law enforcement the ability to use search terms, okay, to basically do, um, uh, you can upload, let's say we have uh, a girl who disappeared, left, and we have a picture of her. So we do, we can upload that picture on, on, the, on, on the data. And what the, what it does is it gives you similarity of a lot of girls, so it gives you enough leads, you as an agent uh, uh, looking at the photos and you can decipher which one might be and then you do all your uh, the legwork. Um, so if I could actually just turn quickly then to Commissioner Katz. Um, 2012, when do you come become the DCF Commissioner? 2011. 2011, so um, this is, you know, she goes from a job, this has been said to her many times, that for many lawyers is a dream job, to a job that I think for many lawyers you can pay them enough money to take. Um, and uh, you know, how much do you know about trafficking in 2011? <laughs> and so can you tell uh, the audience a little about uh, kind of all of the efforts DCF makes, including specifically the heart teams, but the screening that every child now in Connecticut is going through for trafficking and the cost associated with the care for a trafficked victim. 
Certainly. So, uh, as I just said, I really, I, I knew nothing about trafficking. I, uh, I had raised my children. They were often beyond college by the time I took this position, and so I wasn't dealing with the internet world that, that currently uh, inhabits our lives. So I was blissfully ignorant. Um, and the first thing I did is I started looking at some of the statutes because you need to know in, in most jurisdictions, Connecticut is really exceptional. Many, many, many states do not do anything for these girls because technically if a call comes into a care line and you're talking about the statutory definition of abuse or neglect, it's by a caregiver. Well, the pimp is not a caregiver. So most jurisdictions, I found out, uh, were, not really t were not attending to these young girls. Connecticut had started, but the first thing I had to do was think about all the statutory changes to, to both legalize what we were doing, legitimize what we were doing, getting funding for what we were doing, et cetera. And, and the first statute that came to mind was the age of consent. So in Connecticut, Girls at a certain age were being arrested for prostitution, but yet people, so if you had a boyfriend, girlfriend, and they were having cons what was otherwise consensual sexual relationships, the boy, depending upon his age, could be prosecuted for sexual assault in the second degree because the girl was deemed to be under the age of consent. But yet, so that was for purposes of, of one set of statutes, but yet if you look at another set of statutes, that very same girl could have been arrested for prostitution. So it made absolutely no sense. So obviously we had to change the, the statute and had to do it several times. And, and now, now we are protecting all children under the age of 18. So that was, that was obviously uh, significant. And it, it, it wasn't a Herculean lift, but, but it certainly took a couple of years. Um, and I, and I hope Krishna will talk to you about all the work that she's done with Jillian around training in motels and, and identifying places where these girls are trafficked, separate and apart from back pages. Uh, so the other thing we, we learned is, and, and Rod talked about this, uh, these girls don't see themselves as victims. You know, for those of you who remember the whole Patty Hearst saga, it, it's not completely dissimilar. You identify with your captor. You identify uh, with the person who, there's a grooming that goes on and there's information that I think you've, that's already been referenced earlier about what that looks like and some of the terms and how, and how uh, these girls fall into this. And they then identify with their pimps. And it takes an enormous amount of effort. Uh, and, and you were talking about days. I, I'm, I'm thinking years. And so what we've done at DCF is uh, every girl, every case we get, gets referred. And whether or not we can, and we can't always determine immediately if obviously if, if she's been trafficked or, or not, but uh, in all cases that come into the care line, and we process them, and I'm just gonna read to you, we send every case to a heart liaison. And, and what's the heart response team? Heart is Connecticut's human anti-trafficking response team. And every region has a heart liaison, and each office at DCF has a heart liaison. And the liaisons use our practice guide and follow cases for a minimum of 90 days, ensuring that appropriate responses and services are provided to these, these young children. I often say girls, because predominantly they are girls, but not exclusively. With boys, we call it survivor sex, but it's the same thing. <coughs> So then the, um, the youth are referred to a number of services. Uh, they're sent to the appropriate multidisciplinary team for review and a teaming process that includes local law enforcement, state's attorneys, forensic interviewers, medical providers, service providers, et cetera. And lastly, each case is also forwarded to the Connecticut task force uh, to the, the <coughs> investigates the case. But we also do a trauma screening because these girls have been significantly traumatized. I mean, particularly at, and at any age, but you can imagine the nine-year-old, the 10-year-old, the 11-year-old has been sold into this life. And remember, and I don't wanna suggest that it's happening by their parents, it's not, but remember, nearly 120 of the 202 youth identified last year were living in families with guardians. And, and 
either parents or guardians. And so there's a huge lift for the agency to work with those young people, to engage their families. The guilt associated that those families have around what has just happened to their children, what they did, what they didn't do, what they could have done, what they didn't do, imagined or otherwise. And we do a complete trauma screening. And in that time period, the other real challenge, and the last point I'll make on this subject um, for the moment, is that these girls run. And historically, uh, they were arrested. And then they'd be arrested and we'd be able to contain them in, in group homes or in hospital settings. But that's punishment. Why are we punishing the, the kids who have been trafficked? Uh, so it's a real challenge and it's a huge lift for all of our social workers to walk that fine line to be able to, to break through, to engage, to be able to work with these young, these young people in a non-threatening way and get them to stick around long enough to allow you to make any sort of headway with them. And the, and the people who do this work are remarkable. And I will tell you, we recruit also um, for kids who don't have homes. We recruit specialized foster families to be able to work with these kids. We have, um, we, we subsidize in, uh, quite a bit, obviously, um, organizations, uh, providers that work with our youth. Love 146 out of New Haven is one of our, our, our premier providers. And they really know how to work with these, these kids. And it's an in, it is an extremely costly enterprise. So can you just very quickly um, let us know per child what the cost is? Joette, do you have those numbers handy or no? And while you're doing that, um, while you're finding that, um, Jillian, we just heard that every single case since the end of 2012 gets referred to law enforcement. Uh, so over 800. Um, you and I met at the end of 2015 to go find out how many cases had been prosecuted by the state. Um, and then, uh, and as, as uh, Mary Lee pointed out, Jillian is the head of our TIP Council, the Trafficking Persons Council for the state legislature, um, that every year, um, uh, and I have the privilege of actually sitting on that council with her, uh, makes recommendations in the form of legislative and other recommendations um, uh, to the legislature. Uh, so in the end of 2015, uh, the TIP Council does a big scrub uh, can you tell us uh, what the TIP Council learns and kind of what uh, they decide to do about it? Yes, um, can you hear me? So when I stepped into my role at the Trafficking and Persons Council in 2015, um, I too had to be brought up to speed. I didn't fully understand what human trafficking looked like. Um, this is, I've done gender-based violence work for a while and some folks in the room will know that Really, that movement got going in the 70s. Um, the first policies regarding human trafficking didn't start until 2000. So we are in a fairly new um, understanding of human trafficking. That said, Connecticut was one of the first states to pass a felony charge of trafficking in persons, which was passed in 2006. So in 2015, pulled the data, and at that point in time, there had never been a conviction in the state of Connecticut under the trafficking felony charge. Um, so 10 years, we actually uh, prided ourselves as being one of the first states, and yet we had not convicted anyone. Um, and as you've heard, there are many cases being referred. So um, the Trafficking Council pulled together a panel discussion, a round table to understand why no convictions. And one of the biggest barriers that came up immediately was Connecticut's definition. Um, up until 2016, our definition of trafficking in person said that it had to be more than, one, more than one occurrence of sexual contact. And law enforcement said there is no way they would ever wait outside of a motel room for a second occurrence to take place. And so they actually could never have used um, that charge for all those years. Um, I will, I wanna give a little more context of the local. Um, in the year 2016 in Connecticut, there were more than 650,000 ads selling sex in the state of Connecticut alone. So this problem is enormous. Um, and many of those ads are then arranged at hotels and motels. Um, and so I could speak to that 
work as well. Um, so from us knowing that, um, partnered with Krishna um, and a variety of entities, and so we have passed the first of its kind legislation in the country uh, requiring all hotel and motel staff to be trained and to also maintain records um, so that if an investigation is done at a hotel and motel, there will be records for law enforcement. But the training is key uh, because there are many hotels and motels who don't recognize what's taking place is human trafficking. And so if they can begin to recognize that, that will be fantastic. On the other side, there are certainly motels who do know what's going on. And so this new training law holds them accountable. And I'll just say, we know yeah. that um, at least the Marriott Hotel Group, which is now Starwood um, and Ritz-Carlton, uh, because uh, they came in kind of on the front end to partner with Connecticut, uh, has decided worldwide at every single one of its hotels now to, to put this requirement in place to its staff. So if you have a choice, you know, I'm not the big sponsor, but <laughs> they're a good hotel brand. Um, we also know that four other states now are trying to follow suit on this. Um, there were a lot of comprehensive reforms um, that were in that particular bill, um, including conspicuous signage. Um, I know there's additional training uh, that's going on. Uh, Jillian, we're the first state in the entire country to require conspicuous signage as well. Um, but are there still gaps? And you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, one of the big campaigns the Trafficking Council is, um, has embarked on is called End Demand Connecticut. And primarily that's because, again, reviewing the laws we had in place, in 2013, uh, Connecticut enacted a law to um, make paying for sex with a minor a felony charge. They made it a Class C felony um, under the Patronizing a Prostitute Statute, which at the time, in 2013, was still based on the age of 16. So if someone were to purchase sex with a 13-year-old, um, it wasn't until the year 2013 that they could potentially be charged with a felony charge. However, that law had a mistake of age defense that said if the buyer didn't realize she was under the age of 16, then it could be dropped to a misdemeanor. Um, as we know on this panel, but I think one of the gaps is still the general public doesn't know, these buyers know very well who they're purchasing and are seeking to purchase um, children. And so um, we have been progressing in 2016 and now last year we have um, increased the age of the prostitution statute to age 18. And last year we created a standalone charge called commercial sexual abuse of a minor so that no longer will we call these children prostitutes. Um, and if someone is arrested, uh, for purchasing sex, for paying to sexually abuse a child. I also am big on language, if we can change our language. Um, if you're arrested for paying to sexually abuse a child, it is now um, a class B felony. And so we're, we're proud of that work. That said, uh, the rate at which we uh, convict those arrested for prostitution is seven times that of those who buy. And so we have a lot of work to really change the way we think about this crime um, to make sure we do primary prevention, which would be going after the buyer. Okay, we know that since the, um, the new statute has passed, there have been state convictions. Um, uh, not nearly as, as many, but we're in the right direction. And we know that the US Attorney's Office has historically been, been prosecuting these cases, but again, nowhere near the kinds of numbers to match um, the victims. Um, so, uh, Joette, I don't know if you have the numbers handy. There's a reason I actually want to, I'm focused on the numbers a bit. So the, um, what we call survivor care, which is the work that we do with these young people, uh, costs approximately $98,000 on an on annual basis for six slots. We also uh, support, as I indicated, specialized foster care. And one specialized bed per region costs approximately $426,000 on an annual basis. So clearly, like everything else, m money spent to prevention is far smarter, not to mention far more humane. And in terms of your overall budget, I'm sure you have more than sufficient funding for DCF. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just talk a little bit about the, the budget issue? <laughs> just a little, just a little. 
Well, <laughs> you know, when I came in, um, my budget was uh, close to $900 million. It's currently $800 million. And I know that sounds like an enormous figure in the abstract, but when you think we serve 36,000 children, uh, and I'm the statutory parent for 4,200 kids, and you think for those of you in this room what it costs to raise a child up to the age of 18. I think the figures are currently $250,000 for one child. So my budget is 800,000, 800 million, I'm sorry. And that, but that also includes, um, obviously, uh, uh, and I'm sorry if I said 1,000, it's clearly million. Uh, but it also includes running uh, three psychiatric hospitals, a juvenile detention facility, a training school, a wilderness program, um, and 3,400 employees. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out, else out along the way. And, and quite frankly, uh, the work that we've done, not just around issues of sex trafficking, domestic violence, uh, Sandy Hook, really changed our world when it came to uh, identifying, recognizing, and treating issues around uh, behavioral and mental health. Uh, the increase in the opioid crisis has had a devastating effect on DCF as well as, as I think all providers and state agencies and, um, and, and sex trafficking. So. Is there any, um, if you could tell us um, how much money Backpage made last year. Uh, so we don't, nobody has the figures for last year. Um, I can tell you how much money they, I believe if you look at the Senate report, which is also in the public record, um, figure, they have figures going up to, a, I believe 2014, and they were well over $100 million in the US. It's a global company too, by the way. They're in 90 plus, I mean 92 countries. Uh, but in the US, they, they were bringing in revenues over $100 million. And I think on the public record, I think for 2016, you can find in the U.S. 178 million dollars, right? From, there you go. From the erotic ad, from the the adult ad, which is which includes this. Um, so my kind of final two round robins, um, and I'll start with Jillian. Uh, you know, kind of, you've had you've been sitting on the Tip Council now. You've passed probably the most comprehensive trafficking reform. Um, you've been really involved in the gender-based violence and trafficking. You know, what would your advice be to the next governor or the next attorney general about how to handle issues relating to trafficking? I think keep it ever present and have open dialogues about what this crime actually looks like and how we can um, implement effective solutions. So we don't have enough time today to get into the other arenas that we know are taking place, but. We know that human trafficking is taking place in illicit massage parlors here in Connecticut. Um, not all nail salons have trafficking, but trafficking is taking place at nail salons. Um, and so there are populations of people in this state who are being ignored, um, and we need to develop comprehensive responses because right now, for example, with the illicit massage parlors, the response often is to arrest the victim. Um, and so, we need more public-private partnership because our state is facing uh, tough fiscal times, and so the more folks who can be involved, the better, but I think it's, it's continuing to keep it a priority and not let, letting it drop away um, for a decade before we pick it up again. And so, Joette, I mean, completely on the front lines, uh, my sa the same question to you. What would you tell the next attorney general and the next governor? Can I do a friendly amendment? Yes, you can. <laughs> so, so what? I, I guess I want to expand that message, and, and not just to our elected officials, but to all of you, and in particular uh, to our schools. I can't get into our schools. You know, I think there's this perception that if I come, I'm bringing it with me. Mm -hmm. And in truth, I mean, you heard the numbers of, of close to half a million dollars for a specialized foster care home. Uh, close to uh, $100,000 for six uh, treatment programs for a year. It would be far more cost effective to let me in a school and show you a program that would cost $96 called I Am Little Red. It's a 10 minute video to let me get in and talk about a 50 minute curriculum called Youth Awareness Curriculum or youth, uh, the second one is Youth Prevention Curriculum. 
five one-hour ses sessions for youth ages 12 and up. And DCF would do this training for free. I mean, we train thousands of people every year on mandated reporting on any number of subjects. Go on our website, and it's all online. We would do this for free for those schools that would allow us to come in and talk to the students and talk to the teachers and talk to the parents as well as our governor and attorney general around the issues. Uh, and, and I can tell you, I, I know our, our governor is, um, has been very much sensitized to this issue because uh, I'm relentless. <laughs> And I, I can, I can um, confirm the relentlessness. Um, so Rod, uh, what would you, what's your advice to law enforcement? Yeah, I'd like to first say, I agree with Commissioner Katz. Uh, when I used to be the Homeland, I tried to reach out to the high schools. And I used to uh, ask them, listen, uh, I can have agents, I can go myself and really talk about human trafficking at the high school, and I was turned down. I think at this point we need to realize we do have an issue here in Connecticut, in the world as well. And for law enforcement, um, you know, I remember years ago when I used to have a badge and a gun, I thought, you know, I can do it by myself. And I realized you cannot do it by yourself as a law enforcement officer. You need a task force. You need also a, a partnership, as you're saying. You need to have the local, uh, law enforcement, the state uh, police, the federal agents, all together, working together, involving service providers, it's huge, and, and, and being all together to fight this crime. And I can guarantee you, you cannot do it alone. I tried to do it alone myself in the old days. And it's, you know, like Krishna said, those cases are very hard. Those cases take two, three years investigation on one case, and they're so complex. Uh, you need a forensic interviewer. You need to identify the victim. You need that victim, and a lot of times you deal with hostile victims. So it's, you need, you need a strong partnership. You need the public. You need, you know, like we did at the hotel in the train. Uh, we go and talk to the hotel employees and have them think outside the box and establish some kind of policy and say, hey managers, you are accountable for this. You can be sued. So we need to do an outreach. And as a law enforcement officers, we need to understand that we need everyone to do this job. And so we, you know, we know this is a difficult issue involving a multifaceted response, right? Everything from the prevention, the awareness, the education, revamping laws, training first responders, and training service providers. Um, but it is not lost on all of us that this is a crime um, with impunity, right? We are just not seeing a justice system in my mind that is responding on a global level, on an international level, and even on a national or a state level uh, to this crime. Uh, so Vinny, <laughs> um, what would you tell us here in Connecticut? You've heard we have at least you know, 800 children currently identified. We know 70% of them likely on Backpage. Um, uh, what, what advice would you give us, and then what advice would you give other, uh, you know, other folks uh, around our country uh, who are seeking justice? Sure. Um, you know, I, let me add one little point, though, everybody's comments on um, getting these curriculums into the schools. So I, I've spoken with dozens of families that have gone through this awful, awful tragedy where their child was swept up and trafficked. Every girl I've interviewed and I've talked to and all the families I've represented they, 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 did, they weren't um, taken against their will. They started out thinking they were in control and that they were making these decisions for themselves. They quickly realized they, were, they had made a horrible mistake. But that's why education is so critical. And that type of preventative, retroactive policy, I can't believe that there's any pushback. I mean, it's shocking. I mean, don't just get into the high schools either. Get into the middle schools, okay? I mean, my, my clients are in middle school. They're in seventh grade. Um, so I will echo that 100%. You gotta get into high schools. If you save one kid, that's enough. Um, anyhow, so and as far as from a civil standpoint, because that's what I do, I do civil cases. Uh, I wish I had police powers um, so I could put some of these guys in prison myself, but I don't. 
So to the folks that do criminal cases, I would say, please just bring suit. The worst thing that happens is you lose. Um, you know, and you live to fight another day. And that's what we're doing. That's what my, my law firm, we, we've got cases in four different states. We're just filing cases. We're not turning anybody away. Because why, I mean, why not? You know, I mean, especially if you've, if you've had enough good fortune like uh, the folks that I work with, or you've had enough good cases, you, you take risky cases like this. And, there, and I know there's hundreds of lawyers that probably feel the exact same way. And so we've all got the briefing, we've all got the know-how, it's just a matter of, and this is probably one of the more difficult things when we're talking about this issue, these are not easy cases for a, for a young girl to decide to bring. Because that's really who's leading the charge, it's the mothers and it's the daughters that are willing to be courageous and tell their story. I watched my clients get deposed. It was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, I mean, beyond most of our experiences, probably an entire lifetime, difficult to have to tell their story, especially to a defense attorney who's challenging their, their case. But if you have uh, individuals who have that courage and who will bring a case, bring these cases. In every court around the country, bring these cases. And if you can't find lawyers that are gonna bring these cases, we'll, I'll bring, I guarantee you we'll bring these cases. I can guarantee you that. I think we're gonna have to hold you to it. Um, I just wanna point out, uh, the state of California just passed the first ever law requiring uh, through, what grade to what grade? Seventh to twelfth grade, Seventh to 12th grade uh, sex trafficking education. Um, and so it's something that the citizens of Connecticut could lobby for um, that I would highly encourage. Uh, we have the head of the TIP Council here. <laughs> um, we could, you know, it's something that I think that we can certainly get done here. Um, my last question, I'll give everybody just 20 seconds to respond and when I'll turn it over to Mary Lee. Um, and if it's okay, I'll take a little bit of privilege here. Um, I'll let you know, you know, I've actually had uh, six, over 16 years as a federal prosecutor. Um, I have had the chance to put a lot of people in jail and it has felt very, very good and that's not something I would have has said before. Um, but the greatest privilege is actually standing up um, and standing with and walking with the victim as they actually walk into a courtroom and get justice for themselves. And um, so kind of um, in the words of, of Dr. King, what I'd say to all of you, and to borrow from him, um, in the end, you know, we will remember the words of, we won't remember the words of our enemy, we will remember the silence of our friends. And this is a time when if you stay silent, I feel like you are being complicit. You really are. Um, we just owe this to our kids and we certainly owe it to the kids in Connecticut. Um, I feel so strongly that this is an issue that I think can be eradicated in the state of Connecticut. Um, Joette and, and um, Jillian can tell me if I'm wrong or Rod. Um, you know, 800 kids, we can eradicate that and we can be a model. Um, but it's gonna take every single one of us to actually show the courage to do that and it's gonna take a political will that I am not seeing. Um, we have a group of us, including the YWCA um, and uh, Global Fed, uh, have written a letter to the Attorney General to ask that instead of the mothers and the victims standing up on their own, that Connecticut be the first state and have the courage to stand up and file the lawsuit against Backpage. We have what other states don't have. We have a DCF commissioner with the kind of data to actually prove damages. So we can actually go ahead and get some of that $100 million for our state, for the kids who have been victimized, and we have the equivalent of a class action. Um, we have what we, you know, what the states were able to do to the tobacco, um, uh, and we need to set that example. So what I am gonna ask every single person in this room is to please read the letter. I think um, Mary Lee's provided it to you. Um, to call your attorney general, to call your governor, to call every single state rep to get on social media um, and to actually go ahead and demand. And when the next governor's race comes up and the next attorney general's race comes up, you, at, you, you let your attorney general uh, candidate know you're not gonna vote for them unless they're gonna do this. But you actually do not stay silent anymore and just, you know, I will go again say to you, I do think being silent is now being complicit. Um, and so with that, I will ask all of my panelists, give me 20 seconds on what you will tell, what you, your advice would be to the public at large in terms of what they can do. And we'll start with Jillian. I would tell you can, um, you can start to use different language. That's really my takeaway for many people. And so um, do say things instead of calling them Johns. No, they're individuals who pay to sexually exploit our most vulnerable and our children. Um, so just use different language and, and have the conversation with people. heard 
If you see something, say something. If you're standing in a, in a hotel lobby and you see a young girl with a lot of makeup on with some credit card paying for a room, get engaged. If you see things when you're pumping gas and, and you see girls lurking behind places and you see them alone, get engaged. The, the thing that's really amazing to me, I mean, I will tell you, uh, this is going on in your neighborhood, in your backyard. I mean, I live in Fairfield, and, um, and I talk to parents in Fairfield. I, I don't get into the schools, as I indicated, but I really engage. I have a, a, a lot of friends who are criminal defense attorneys. I was a public defender in a past life. And they can't go to a dinner party with, with me without me going on some tirade. <laughs> Because it's happening, I mean, I had a girl very quickly last year that we were finally able to rescue as she was about to be sold to, uh, a, a, what, do, what, what should I call this guy? He's a, a creep in a dirt bag in, in New Jersey, <laughs> fr frankly. Let's call him what he is. But the person who was selling him, it took, it took, me, it took me weeks to find her, our department, and then we knew where she was. We couldn't engage local law enforcement because they were, they were understaffed because juvenile is always seems to be the, the, the uh, department that gets under-resourced. Uh, so we finally said, you know what, we think there's a gang affiliation. And then suddenly everybody got excited. <laughs> and they rescued her the day before she was about to be sold, but only after her current pimp had um, tattooed a dollar sign on her face. So we owe this to ourselves, but most importantly, we owe this to our children, to our grandchildren, to our neighbors, to the children around us, because this is not the society, this is not the civilization that we want to inhabit. So that's my, that's my parting word. If you see something, you say something. My advice is call Senator Blumenthal, <laughs> call Senator Murphy. Uh, as a law enforcement officer, or retired law enforcement officer, what I've dealt with is understaffing. Do you know how many federal agents work in trafficking in the state of Connecticut? Yeah, but maybe three or four, okay? Thank God for the state and local. We have what we call task force officers helping, okay? We need funding, we need more agents. We need to make it as real pro a real priority. Even though it is, quote unquote, priority, human trafficking, we need to make it as real. And it's, it's not gonna happen without you. You know, putting pressure, calling your political leaders and make them, have make them do inquiries and push for a better budget. And I think what Rod's trying to say there is um, what happens when you're in federal law enforcement, U.S. Attorney's Office or an agency, is the minute the head of your organization has to go testify in Congress, uh, all of a sudden the thing becomes a priority all the way to you. So uh, you're telling your, your senators, start calling the, the head of the FBI and Homeland Security and start asking questions about trafficking. And start asking questions about what they're doing about trafficking. Because all of a sudden then it'll go down to the field offices to start doing something about trafficking. In addition to what everybody else just said, um, I see kind of the full spectrum of people in here, young people, older people. I would say um, do a little research tonight or talk to some other of the people who are here who are more familiar with kind of the local uh, groups that are involved on these issues. But don't think for a second that they don't need your help and that you can't somehow get involved on the ground and tangibly be a part of this movement and a part of really affecting change. And number two, which is equally important, um, but sometimes not as fun to do, so I like to get down and get my hands dirty, so do that first. Number two, get your checkbook out and give money to those groups. I do that every year myself. Most of my friends who are in these circles especially, we make a point to do the same thing. Find out who these groups are and help them out. $100, $200, $50, anything. 
And on that note, I'll just say, we didn't even touch the labor trafficking issue, but one of the things I do think is really important on the labor side is to understand more and more how you're consuming, um, because how you're consuming is directly related to slavery um, all over our world, your clothes, your food. Um, to that note, I'll just say Global Fed is out there with uh, products that are looking at transparency and supply chain, but that is another area and a whole other discussion. I'm gonna ask you to hold uh, the applause for my awesome, awesome panel. I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Lee uh, for the questions from the audience. Thank you so much. I don't think we should wait for a round of applause, actually. Let's, let's go ahead and thank all of cards available if anyone else to, would like to ask a question. We have some already. I'll just get started really quickly and I think this one is for Joette. When you say get engaged at a hotel or gas station, what approach would you recommend taking? You know, when I, when I think about it, um, there's no one way. I mean, those of us who uh, are parents, how do you how do you talk to teenagers? <laughs> okay, <laughs> but if if that so, my recommendation is you you see somebody, and and it really looks suspicious to you. I mean, I, you know, certainly you can always call nine one one. You can call police. I don't I don't discourage that. You can also ask to see somebody in the hotel administration because now that they've all been trained, they should be doing this for you. Uh, you don't have to do it alone, but I also think there's a human touch, and you look at somebody's face, and you ask them how they are, and what's going on, and you start a conversation, and it's amazing what you can find. And then, from there, you can then call 911, and then call host, the, the, obviously, the hotel administration, but I don't think there's any substitute for that human contact, particularly when you're talking about somebody who is so vulnerable. One of the things I would say is, um, if you are worried, you know, in addition to talking to anybody at the hotel, um, the Polaris hotline number, uh, if you call that hotline immediately and say the person's in that hotel, they call out to law, they will send the tip out to all the law enforcement um, immediately, and they'll do it for you. And all you're doing is reporting facts, you're not making conclusions. What I say to you is just report the facts as you've seen them. This is what I'm seeing, I don't know if it, what it is. So there's a couple of questions that are, these two are very similar. Are there any indications a child is more prone to being trafficked than other, other children? How do adults find these children or uh, identify them? And then in a similar vein, what is the quote profile or risk factors of an underage victim in the town of Greenwich, for example? There is an entire, um, but the Department of Homeland Security web, uh, website has actually an entire list of risk factors, um, and so does the DCF website. It has an entire um, list of risk factors and things to look for. So if you're looking for more local, I definitely look at the DCF one. Okay. Do you believe the United States has a leadership role to play in the war against global trafficking? Um, Haiti, India, et cetera. Is there some way that the average citizen can get involved in that global effort? I think we have a huge um, leadership role. First, I think you know the labor side, which I know we didn't touch on, 70% of all trafficking worldwide is labor. Um, a significant amount of that is our consumption. It really is. It's our clothes, buying, it's everything from the makeup, it's the Mika, it's our smartphones. Um, we have massive leadership role. I think this is where we have to get our corporations engaged as well as um, investment. There's a lot of groups doing some amazing stuff. What I'd ask you to do is, um, even though it's a raw cut website, unchained.org, if you go and look at the resources, um, there's a variety of ways of getting information and, and figuring out how to get engaged. But educate yourself as a consumer um, to understand transparency and supply chains. And, and as Vinny said, there's a lot of organizations that are engaged globally as well that you can actually support and, and work with. Can we go back to talking about uh, Facebook, Google, and so forth? Are any of these big companies cooperating with the government to end this crime? So I was actually at a conference, uh, the National Crime Victims uh, Bar Association Conference in Portland last month. And we had a really interesting um, round table with a, with a top executive from Facebook. And I learned a whole lot about 
um, all the ways that Facebook, in particular, I'm focusing on them just because that's most I'm most familiar with it, at least recently. Um, all the ways that they are helping um, locate victims and find uh, find you know runaways and get services to victims and working with social services to work with victims and um, you know, really interesting stuff, and I kind of sat there and I listened, and I had been invited there specifically to kind of drop the hammer on some of their opposition to the federal legislation because it's very hypocritical. But, so I sat there though and I listened and I listened and I listened, and they're doing a lot. I mean, I'll just say, yeah, they, they are doing a lot, but the second the conversation turned to, well, what about this CDA thing that's allowing websites like Backpage to um, profit off child sex trafficking and sex trafficking and commercial sex in general, um, you know, do you have a problem with uh, passing some sort of amendment that might enable lawyers and state prosecutors to bring claims um, against these websites and hold them accountable? And suddenly, I mean, the entire temperature in the room went up by about 20 degrees and kind of a heated dialogue um, commenced. And what it came down to, and this is where I kind of, I, just kind of pointedly said to her, um, you know, look, uh, the, the solution to this problem, or like a meaningful solution, it's gonna cost you money. That's, yeah, that's the point. You've made billions of dollars, now you're gonna have to worry about guys like me suing you sometimes. <laughs> Guess what, we're gonna lose, probably, because I'm sure you have really, really strong safeguards for preventing this type of stuff, and eventually, like every other business that's been sued, your industry will even out, it'll balance out, and only the bad guys are gonna be the ones that are targeted. And, um, but what it comes down to, even for a big company like Facebook, they try to say, oh no, we wanna protect the little guy, uh, the next Facebook. But um, as far as I could tell, it's, it's, it's simply money, they have immunity. If you're a corporation, look, every business in the world, or I'll say in the country at least, is held to a reasonable standard of care, okay? Every business is required to exercise reasonable care. That's it, it's called negligence. And if you don't exercise reasonable care, you may get sued if somebody gets hurt because of your failure to do that. Well, all these websites don't have to abide by that rule that every single company in the country has to abide by. And so our argument is, you know what, it's time to join the rest of the world, the rest of the you know, corporate America, and on this singular issue of at least child sex trafficking, although I'm much more of a fan of just sex trafficking in general and attacking it for everyone because the difference between an 18 year old and a 16 year old is not much. Um, but let's start with child sex trafficking and go from there because at the end of the day too, I'm not even sure you're gonna see you know, the, the cascading horrors that the tech folks are all predicting. But, but so the answer is they're doing, they are doing a lot, they do work with law enforcement. I think subpoenas is a little bit of a different thing. There's other federal laws that come into play that prevent Google and folks like that from giving up your emails, let's say, if law enforcement tries to get them. Rod, you can probably speak more to that. I don't know if you've ever had. No? Well, anyhow, there's, there's other uh, protections that come in there that you've got to get certain court orders to get stuff. But um, they're doing a lot, but I think most of it, as far as I can tell, is good PR. Um, and when it really comes down to brass tacks, they're not willing to actually move on anything meaningful so that we can take down some of these bad players. So I think maybe this last question makes sense for Krishna. Um, Me Too and Time's Up are making sexual harassment unacceptable. Is there anything similar being done to make being a, a, a client of child trafficking or prostitution unacceptable? So no, we're not seeing, you know, we haven't seen that kind of movement. Um, certainly I, the I Am Jane Doe movement, I think is the closest that we're seeing. We haven't kind of seen it at the level with Me Too. I think the, the incredible thing, the extraordinary thing about Me Too is the fact that um, women are feeling so empowered to come in and tell their stories. We're not still seeing that with the trafficking side. Um, uh, and I think this crime is still so hidden. It's still so um, clandestine. Um, and they're still not empowered to come out. And because I think that the group that you're dealing with is still so vulnerable. So vulnerable. Right, right. So no. Joan, if you would like to ask a question, just add to that briefly. I mean, you know, statutes have changed. Uh, statute of limitations, normally it's a two year or three years within which you have to bring a lawsuit when a harm occurs. And when it comes to issues of sexual abuse, and every state is different, but I, I would imagine uh, you could speak to this if there's any state that hasn't uh, really 
gotten closer to the times. They've extended the statute of limitations, and, and so women are now 35 years of age bringing lawsuits for things that happened to them when they were 17 because the law has finally caught up and recognized that the trauma associated with all of this lasts years and years and years. So the idea that you're going to get um, a 16-year-old to say, me too, is just not going to happen. And it's not going to happen until she's probably 35, if, if she can even do it then. So I think, uh, and, and that's, that's part of what we're seeing now with the Me Too movement, is these women are talking about things that happened to them 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I, I think you know at some point we may see that, but it's, it's a long way down the road because of the trauma associated with this, the guilt associated with this, the vulnerability of this particular population. And I would jump in that we, we, need, to, we need to challenge our culture that sexualizes our youth. Um, I have young children. If you go into a Halloween store, um, if you go to get costumes at Halloween time, the costumes for my three-year-old, now she's five, my four-year-old, my five-year-old are the sexualized cop, um, the sexualized princess. Uh, and so that goes all the way to pornography. Um, and so we really need to look at our culture, um, challenge the sexualization of youth, and again, challenge this notion that men will and need to buy sex. No, they don't. Um, and until we get to that place, I think this crime will continue. And so we really need to, as a culture, decide um, what is the world we want for ourselves and our children. So Jillian, Joette, Rod, We're so grateful to have your expertise and your passion here tonight uh, and to join you in this fight. Thank you all for coming this evening, and we hope to see you again next year. Take care.